already won your Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I'm outside today. I don't know, is it gonna be one of the last times I can come out this season? I've got a long sleeve, heavy long sleeve shirt on and now that I'm sitting here in the sun, I'm warm enough, but I was a little chilly walking here. And uh, 9.30, I don't know why the sun's in my eyes. I guess because the seasons change, Sean, so that all changes. So uh, I'm a little glary, but I'm just gonna do my best. Here is a, one of my favorite things about Japan. Look at this. This is a can of hot coffee, which you can purchase for about a dollar. This was about a dollar fifty because it's premium from any vending machine. They have hot coffee, hot beverages available from vending machines from about October to spring. And in the spring and summer, they're only cool, but there's nothing like a can of hot coffee for a dollar. That'll warm me up, even as a hand warmer. I discovered these the first day of my first visit to Japan. Because of jet lag, I was in Osaka, and my mom and I woke up on an ungodly early hour, and there was no Starbucks or any coffee shop open, and we managed to figure out the Japanese currency enough to put some coins in the machine and got some hot coffee and every time I taste one, especially the first one of the season, I'm transported back to that moment where mom and I just bonded us over, oh my god, it's hot coffee from a vending machine. <laughs> the birds aren't uh, being very cooperative this morning. Today is my September book haul, and which I thought was going to be puny, and maybe it's not that big, but the, the tomes are tomes. They're big. I got some uh, door stoppers here, so why I decided to lug everything out here? Well, I thought it might be my last chance, but this is probably an, would have uh, made much more sense as an at-home video. <laughs> so, let's get started. First is I bought a hardcover copy of one of my favorite reads from this year. I had read it on ebook much er, several months back. Uh, Stephen Florida by Gabe Habash. I've done a review video of this which has received about eight and a half hits so I won't say another word about it uh, to encourage you to go and check out <laughs> my review. Anyway it's a wonderful novel about a college wrestler and that doesn't sound like a Sean the Book Maniac type of book, but it definitely was. It was a very emotionally satisfying read. And the best cover of the year, don't you think? And I love the opening few sentences. My mother had two placentas, and I was living off both of them. I was supposed to have a twin. When the doctor yanked me out, he said, There's a good chance this child will be quite strong. This is the story my parents always told me, but I never really believed it. I also bought a hardcover copy of John Boyne's novel that everybody's reading and talking about of late, including me. I've already, st I've just started this a few days ago. John Boyne's The Heart's Invisible Furies. Yeah, see the wind is blowing my little uh, stand, so this is going to be a vertigo video. Anyway, I love this so much already. I'm about 40 pages in. If things continue in this vein, it's going to be one of my top reads of the year. I'm doing this as an audio text combo. The audio narration is masterful with that gorgeous Irish accent. And uh, I'm happy to have the hardcover as well. Wow! Next I have uh, Alan Hollinghurst's new mo novel, The Sparsholt Affair. It came out in November and I got my copy off the internet as soon as it was available. And I am doing a buddy read of this with Wild Reads and some other people whose channel names I'm blanking on. If you are interested in doing a buddy read of this, please send me a comment in below. This is getting pretty good reviews, so I'm quite excited to get into it. Oh, sorry, I'm doing the buddy read in December. December, December. Whoa, my books are starting to blow. The opening line of The Sparshold Affair doesn't stand alone, so I'll read the opening paragraph. The evening when we first heard Sparshold's name seems the best place to start this little memoir. We were up in my rooms talking about the club. 
Peter Coyle, the painter, was there, and Charlie Farmonger and Ebert Dax. A sort of vote had taken place, and I had emerged as the secretary. I was the oldest by a year, and as I was exempt from service, I did nothing but read. Everett said, oh, Freddie reads two books a day, which may have been true. I protested that my rate was slower if the books were in Italian or Russian. That was my role, and I played it with the supercilious aplomb of a student actor. The whole purpose of the club was getting well-known writers to come and speak to us and read aloud from their latest work. We offered them a decent dinner, in those days a risky promise, and after dinner a paneled room packed full of keen young readers, a provision we were rather more certain of. When the bombing began, people wanted to know what the writers were thinking. Okay, this next series of books I received uh, as a gift exchange. It was a Halloween gift exchange on the app Litzy that I'm always mentioning. Three or four times a year, a lovely Litzy lady arranges a secret Santa exchange. It originally was just at Christmas, and then it became, I think I'd done it three times this year. Easter, maybe, I forget. Easter and Halloween, and then the Christmas one is just being organized now. And it's really fun. You get assigned a secret Santa, and then they peruse your TBR on Goodreads or on Litzy and send you a box of books which you're not supposed to open until the appointed day. So I have a box here, so I'm going to simulate an unboxing. I'm becoming so booktubey. <laughs> and my uh, secret Halloween Santa is a lovely uh, friend of mine from Litzy, Trish, who lives in, I think, Liverpool, but certainly the UK. I didn't know she was the one giving me stuff until I opened it, but she knows me very well. She also knows I'm really a bailer, so I think she went to extra links to choose books that I might not bail on. So let's unbox, shall we? You're supposed to also include seasonal goodies. So this is also a favorite things video. Oh my god. Um, I, when I send my box of stuff, I don't include very much of that. I prefer to spend my money on books because probably that's what people are interested in. But I got some other stuff, so let's start with that. Here's the box. And I'm kind of nervous about even getting into this because it's so windy, but Tiddly Vampire's Chocolates. Can you see that? I haven't even opened this, but this I think is sticky note bookmarks or page markers aren't those cute i haven't un undone the torn it open to have a look but i think that's what they are An alice in wonderland bookmark you read that Dracula bookmark. I haven't opened it so the quote from Dracula is obscured by the lovely ribbon, but that's really cute. And this is why I think she might be. <laughs> My Trish might be in Liverpool because she sent me a Liverpool postcard. And the Shakespeare and Company. Oh, there's one other little thing you kind of might have to get. Oh, here it is. Have some other Halloween chocolates. This little button says, can't, I'm reading. It's the story of my life. All right, so now to the books. This is a used book. Yeah. Indigenous American novelist who I, maybe I've heard his name, James Welch, which doesn't sound all that Native American, does it? Called Winter in the Blood. Trish knows that I'm really into it indigenous literature so this looks very interesting it's set on a blackfoot reservation in montana and i believe the writer is from that part of the world and that tribe in the tall weeds of the boro pit i took a leak and watched the sorrel mare her colt beside her walk through burnt grass to the shady side of the log and mud cabin this has two of i believe they're George Eliot's two first published works. One is a short story called The Lifted Veil, 
and it's not on the cover, but the second one, which is actually of more interest to me, is her essay, which I certainly heard about. Silly novels by silly no by silly novels by lady novelists. I remember not reading, but hearing about them during my school university days. So here's the first sentence of the essay. First couple sentences. Silly novels by lady novelists are a genus with many species, determined by the particular quality of silliness that predominates in them, the frothy, the prosy, the pious, or the pedantic. But it is a mixture of all these, a composite order of feminine fatuity, that produces the largest class of such novels, which we shall distinguish as the mind and millinery species. All right. How do you really feel? This is a no novel by a writer that I've never heard of, Hilary Jordan's Mudbound. And this uh, is a signed copy, which is exciting. It's an American novel, but it must be probably the British edition. And it's about a Mississippi Delta far cotton farmer who brings his city-bred wife back to the farm in 1946, and that's a rude awakening for her. So. The Second World War has just ended, and this farmer's much more sensitive and uh, compassionate brother comes home from the war, as does the eldest son of one of the black sharecroppers on the farm, and the story is all of that racial post-war stuff threaded through uh, family story. It sounds really good, but when I got this book, I knew nothing about it. Since then, I've heard really good things about it. This is a book for a book Lovers, I'd rather be reading A Library of Art for Book Lovers by Guinevere de la Mer. They don't, they don't get much more of a literary name than Guinevere de la Mer. It's got essays by Maura Kelly, who I don't know, but also Anne Patchett and Gretchen Rubin. And just wonderful book art. Like mouth-watering book art. Love this silhouette one. Look at that. I love that one so much. So that's really cool. This is a novel about a, uh, it's a uh, romance between a Palestinian and a uh, Israeli uh, called Ishmael's Oranges by Claire Hajaj. Starts out in uh, Jaffa, April 1948, and carries on to. London of the swinging 60s. I love the kind of interracial, intercultural, Romeo Juliet type stories. As long as they're not too romantic. I don't really care for the romantic part, but the uh, intercultural and the peace through love stuff really tugs on my heartstrings. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this and I'd never heard a, a thing about it. Opening line from 1948. Yala, Salim, farm boy. The Jews are coming for you. They're going to kick you out and break your skinny arse like a donkey. And the last one in the box is uh, Trisha's, she said it's her favorite novel by her favorite writer. And it happens to be John Boyne, who I just started his uh, newest one. And so I'm really excited to have this, The Absolutist by John Boyne. And I didn't read the first line of the Heart's Invisible Furies on this video because I've done it twice now. So you can go back to my Friday reads just the other day. Uh, that's the most recent one, so I won't read it a third time. Now that I've read the first line of this, John Boy <laughs> really knows how to start off a novel. This one is about the uh, World War II veteran who in 1919 looks up his war buddy, his, I guess maybe dead, it doesn't say, his dead war buddy's sister is the friend whose sister he's tracking down. He didn't desert, but he uh, declared himself a conscientious objector in the middle of the battle, on the battlefield. It says here. So that sounds pretty interesting. Here's the opening <laughs> sentence. I love John Boyne's opening lines. <laughs> Seated opposite me in the railway carriage, the elderly lady in the fox fur shawl was recalling some of the murders that she had committed over the years. Okay, I definitely want to keep reading that. So that is my unboxing. That is my Halloween 
gift exchange. So they're just, if you're not on Litzy, this is a good chance to uh, sign up there. And it's, of course, voluntary to do the ex gift exchange. But the Secret Santa one is just being sorted out now. And I think the deadline for submitting your name for that is November 8th. Give it some thought. All right, you saw my Jimbocho Tokyo Book store district uh, vlog vlog perhaps the other day and the only book that I ended up buying for myself I didn't have such good luck although I got some books as gifts for other people is a rather beat up copy of a J.R. Ackerley novel we think the world of you and I have never read I've only read one book by him but it almost changed my life it was such a wonderful book and it's his memoir called my father and myself and I'll probably do a review or some kind of a essayistic video at some point about gay memoir because that was the one that really spoke to me the most deeply. And it's the only thing I've ever read of his. So when I saw this for like a dollar, I, I picked it up. It's a little bit, it's got a little bit of a, it's like a little wax stain, oval shaped wax stain on the cover. It's not in the best shape, but it's good enough for a reading copy. It's interesting. The love between friends, Johnny, young and feckless, and Frank, middle-aged and devoted, and their love for Johnny's beautiful pedigree bitch, Evie. These are the main themes of this extraordinary novel. So I assume they're a gay couple, but that you couldn't say that in 1960. This was published in 1960, although this Penguin edition is probably a little bit later than that. I'm very curious to read it sometime. Opening line. Johnny wept when I was taken down to visit him. It was a thing that I had never seen him do before. I sat down beside him on the hard bench and took his hand in mine. Well, there's a gay opening if ever I heard one, especially for 1960. One of the things that I do when I, because I bail on so many books is I usually try to find a good home for them, either as a gift or a trade with another Litzy member or somebody that's on my Goodreads friends list, and I will probably start doing that on BookTube as well. So I have traded uh, back and forth several books with a lovely Litzy person who I know is a BookTube stalker or watcher. I won't uh, identify her by name, but I've been kind of telling her she should start up her own BookTube channel, and she lives in Asia. And so this just came in the mail the other day from her. It's a Sylvia Townsend Warner novel, Summer Will Show. And it's a New York Review of Books book. Published 1936, originally. I've never read a Sylvia Townsend Warner before, and I'm quite excited. So this one is kind of a historical novel. The main character is Sophia Willoughby, and she's an, from an aristocratic family. And she sends her husband packing because he's such a scallywag. He's uh, you know, cheating on her left, right, and center. So she packs him off to Paris. But then later sh she ends up going to Paris herself and striking up a relationship. And I don't know what that means, this being a Sylvia Townsend Warner novel, with one of her husband's mistresses. And it's the dawn of the 1848 revolution in France. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. It was on this very day, the 13th of July, and in just such weather that Sophia Willoughby had been taken to see the Duke of Wellington. At 10 o'clock precisely, the open barouche came to the door, and Sophia, who had been dressed and ready and punctual, it seemed for hours, ran down the steps to admire the turnout. Walking stiffly, her legs well apart in order not to crumple the fluted frills of her long white muslin drawers, she had inspected the vehicle and the horses from all sides. Her scrutiny was searching, a child's exacting curiosity, sharpened and stiffened by the consciousness of being an heiress, the point advancing on the future, as it were, of that magnificent triangle in which Mr. and Mrs. Aspend of Blandimer House, Dorset, England, made up the other two apices. That's wonderful writing, I really like that, so looking forward to getting into this one. The last two I hauled yesterday, so technically that's November, but I don't care. This is my video and this is my channel. <laughs> and I'm so excited about these two. I went to the new bookstore, Kino Kunia. They have a, love, a large English language section. That's the uh, 
sixth floor, it's entirely English or foreign language, but mostly English. And I stumbled upon this, which I'd never heard of, but my eye, I've said this, this could be part of the drinking game too. I know I've said this at least three times before. When I'm in a bookstore, my eye always goes to the book or the author that I've never heard of before. So in the new release section, I found this. The 16 Trees of the Somme by Lars Mitting. This is a Norwegian novel in translation, originally published in Norway in 2014 and just newly out this year in English. And this sounds fascinating. Apparently, uh, Mitting is Norway's best-selling novelist. And this is about a boy growing up on a, a remote mountain farmstead in Norway with his grandfather. And his parents died when he was very young, and he's never really been told what ha happened to his parents. But he has a, a very vague memory of his mom. His grandfather's brother has also died, but I don't know when, it doesn't say. But he's really connected with this mystery of how his parents died. When I flipped through it and read a few sentences here and there, I thought, oh, this really... I mean, it was more expensive than I wanted to pay. It was $25, but I just couldn't stop myself from buying it. For me, my mother was a scent. She was a warmth. A leg I clung to. A breath of something blue. A dress I remember her wearing. She fired me into the world with a bowstring, I told myself. And when I shaped my memories of her, I did not know if they were true. I simply created her as I thought a son should remember his mother. Yeah, I'm really excited for this one. Has anybody else heard of it? Heard anything about it? This last one I'm just totally geeking out about since I stumbled on it yesterday. Again, because of what I look for in a bookstore, I pulled this book off the shelf and then I checked the price and most paperbacks, most English books are at least 20 bucks if not more. I was on a bit of a budget, especially after I decided to get this other book. But I found this and this was only uh, $13, brand new, huge soft cover. Just to give you an idea of the size of it. So this is your basic hardcover size and this is the size of this soft cover. It's tall and uh, narrow and I love that. This is a Polish novel from the 19th century called The Doll by... I've done so much pronunciation practice of these Polish names this morning. Let's see how well I do 20 minutes later. His name is pronounced Bolesław Prus. Bolesław Prus and The Doll. This was published... The story is in Warsaw under Russian rule in the late 1870s, but the book itself, 1890. First English pu publication, 1972. But this is from the Central European Classics series by Central European University Press, 1996. I have never heard of this book or this writer at all, but, you know, when I saw the price and the shape of it, <laughs> And the fact that it was a Polish novel, I've read Wyoletta Gregg's uh, short story. Is it a short stories or a short novel? I forget. Could be experienced as either. Swallowing Mercury. Earlier this year, I quite enjoyed it. But aside from that, I haven't read anything from Poland. I just couldn't stop myself from buying this. And I'm so excited about it that I'm now thinking that I, because it's 680 pages, I'm now thinking of doing Tome Topple. Is that the right word? Tome Topple challenge? This month. It starts the middle of the month. I'm doing this and some other big books. I don't know. Can I find anybody to buddy read this with me? <laughs> it just, I just have, it's, I'm just so drawn to it. I'm just geeking out. I can't stop fondling it. And look at the cover illustration. The middle aged hero, his name is Wokolski and he's a middle-class businessman, very successful. And he is, his life is being destroyed by his obsessive love for an aristocratic woman, Isabella, who's the doll. There's a lot of Polish names in here and I, in opening paragraph, but we'll see how it goes.
Early in 1878, when the political world was concerned with the Treaty of San Stefano, the election of a new pope, and the chances of a European war, Warsaw businessmen and the intelligentsia who frequented a certain spot in the Krakowski Predmischa were no less keenly interested in the future of the haberdashery firm of J. Minsel and S. Wokolski. Yeah, I'm just really drawn to this, and I'm not even sure why, but I have a feeling I might try to squeeze this one in this, this month for Tom Topple. Yeah. My first undergraduate degree was in history, and I, my focus, my specialty, uh, you know, I kind of focused my studies on Russian history, and I thought I would go on to do a master's in Russian history, but I didn't want to learn the language, so I went down a far different path, and it should have been in English literature all along, but I do love history. But I remember, I didn't study very much Polish history, but just enough to know that it was fascinating, and I remember there's a two-volume history of Poland. It's out of print, but I still think I'm going to track down a second-hand copy at some point and read it. But I remember my first-year undergrad history prof, Ivo Lambi, at the University of Saskatchewan, an Estonian emigre, wonderful professor in the middle of telling us some little snippet of Polish history. He said that this book uh, had the perfect title for the, the history of Poland for centuries and centuries. And the title is God's Playground. I've always remembered that. All right, that is my... What is this? What kind of video is this? That is my October book haul. Not too shabby, hey? Thanks for watching.